question again. So, okay, so before I really start, this joint work with Sergei Kitaev at Iceland and Peter Perry at University of Kentucky. <coughs> so what I'm interested in is number of permutations. And I think about permutation in one line notation such that there's no index i. So I have pi of i less than pi i plus 1 less than pi i plus 2. So I do not want it now double ascents. So the question is alpha n, the number of such permutations in the symmetric group on n elements. So I'm going to turn this control problem into a geometric problem. Let me let x be all the vectors, all the points in the n-dimensional unit cube such that there's no index i. So xi is less than xi plus 1, less than xi plus 2. And I claim Yeah, so alpha n over n factorial is just the n dimensional volume of this set. And you can see that because if I take the n dimensional unit cube and I cut it all the hyperplanes xi equal to xj, I'm going to get n factorial simplices. In fact, let's do it. Here's a three dimensional cube. So borrowed for my children. And then you cut here, here, and then then, and this is how each of the symbols look like. So in the end you see here that I get six simplices, six being three factorial here. So if you're bored. Okay, so just be a little careful with it because it's actually even the smaller simplices here, which has nothing to do with the talk. Okay. Yeah, you can pass it. I mean, you <laughs> but please, please give me back all the pieces so my children doesn't get upset. Okay. However, looking at this set, so how does this set look like? I had to put it back together. Mm, hopefully I can do it. No, not that one. The set looks like this way in the three-dimensional case because I'm missing exactly the simplex corresponding to the permutation one to three. And this is not a nice set to look at, okay? So th this kind of gets stuck at this point, except Let's do another thing. Let's define, instead of having this as a set, let's do view it as a zero one function. Define chi of n of x1 over to xn to be one if there's no index xi less than xi plus one less than xi plus two and zero otherwise. Yes, Menachem? Why is there any reason you're considering three and not four? Well, the reason I considered just three at the moment yeah. is that the case I can actually calculate oh, okay. explicitly. And you will see that in the end. And in fact, later on we can consider other patterns here also. So, but the volume consideration works for four, five? Yeah, it works for anything. Correct. Yeah, and 
and the case with excluding pattern length two is not that interesting. So, yeah, yeah. so this is like the first interesting pattern. Yeah. So the volume argument was used, but mostly when you say if you are considering by congestion, then uh, maybe you need to do, uh, to do something qualitative or to sustain the availability of yeah, to do this uh, really costly and to prove some qualities about the number of linear extensions. And, uh, yeah. And also, also did the slices of the cube. Uh, right, yeah. Yeah. This thing was about labs that you, if you slice the cube, first this way and then that way, the volume is given by the Eulerian numbers. Okay. Yeah, so it's a lot of stuff. Okay, so let me write it this way instead as a zero one function. So instead here, it means I'm integrating of the unit cube, <coughs> this function, x1 over the xn. Well, that's not a very nice integral either. So what we the idea to do here is going to introduce a function, and I'm going to have fn my n function, depending on the last two variables. So this is going to be, I take this thing and I integrate away n minus to the n minus two first variables. So I have k of n, x1 up to xn, and here start the integration. And now, what happens if we look at the mp's first function? So in terms of n, xn plus 1. Well, that's really like the same formula here. 0, 1 to n minus 1. Chi of n plus 1. x1, xn, xn plus 1 e of x1 all to d of xn minus 1. So now, if you look at it, <coughs> first of all, I can factor this function. So I can write it as k of n, x1 up to xn, because this guarantees that I don't have any double sns among these variables. And now I have to check the last position did I get a double ascent here? So I check the last three variables, xn minus 1, xn, and xn plus 1. Which says that I should break the integral here into one one-dimensional integral, and then leaving 0 to 1, n minus 2 here. So I have dx1 of the d x n minus 2, and then the last integral d x n minus 1. So this, continue. Notice I can take this function here, x n minus 1, x n, x n plus 1, has nothing to do with this integral here. So I can take this odd in front of here. So what I get is integral 0 to 1, chi 3, xn minus 1, xn, xn plus 1. And now you see what I have here, you write this factor, is just fn. And I'm integrating the last variable n minus xn minus 1. <coughs> so this suggests that I have a linear operator here to take the function in two variables, f in here, and gives me the next one here. So t. So t of 
f x y integral zero to one chi t x y f of t x d t and this is an, oh, where is an operator on? Well, it's on L two functions over the unit square. So if I now can compute f n by iterating this operator, and then in the end I want to get down back to my number alpha n, I had to integrate. When I have f n, I just need to integrate over these two variables here. But I can express this now as alpha n over n factorial is a, well, I start with a constant function 1. That's really f2, because there's no condition at that point. And I use apply the operator n minus 2 times, and then I take inner product with constant function 1. Well, I think the integral is necessary because the thing is, I'm dealing. If you think about it with permutations, I'm getting more and more entries in my permutation. So I don't think you can limit yourself to the matrix because that's how you use finite order. Yeah, yeah, but this, this is actually what it is. Instead of picking a random permutation, I'm picking a random point inside a unit cube. Sure. And you, basically what it says is, you first you pick a point in this square, then you pick another random variable between 0 and 1, uniform distribution. Yeah. And if you get a double ascent, throw it out. And then you pick the next random variable in 0, 1, get your double ascent, throw it out, yeah. and so on. Okay, you, 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 you're worried about the, the, the having an integral here. Okay. Okay. So, so I had to confess, th this is probably the wrong talk to give in a discrete math seminar, okay? No. Oh, yeah, I've yeah, seen yeah, them yeah, before, yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Oh yeah, I mean, in, in certain there sense. Are many informations yeah. here, but uh, they cannot be put so easily with matrices. Okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Okay, so then what do you do? Well, you have an operator. You raise it to high power. You wonder what the behavior is. Well, we should look at eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of it. So, how does it look like? We should solve the eigenvalue equation. So. Question is lambda times function this thing. Well, it's a little bit hard to write down at this point because the function chi here well has this definition. So to help me, let's write f of xy to be p 
x y for x less than y and q x y for y less than x. And then now let's write down how this operator actually works, how it actually looks like really concretely. So t of fxy, let's do two cases now. Let's look at the case x less than y first in this thing. If x is less than y, then notice that t cannot be less than x because then I have a double ascent. So t has to be greater than x. So in that case, I'm integrating, so I'm integrating t from x to 1. And now you have to plug in t, but t is greater than x. That means that this is going to be the cube part of the function. So this is q t of x dt. And if you do the other case now, y less than x, well, then you're going to see there is no condition on the t. The t can take any value. First, you can go from 0 to x. And we have ptx dt. And then I can go just like above here, greater than x, between x and 1. And we get q t of x dt. So now we can write down the eigenvalue equation. So then you're saying lambda p of x, y is equal to this function, lambda q of x, y is equal to this function, and we have to start solving it. But the first step you have to do is get rid of the integrals. So take the derivative of x, so we get No, no, no. Let me write it down, actually, before I do that. If you look at the system, something interesting happens. Notice that there's no y here. That's gone. That really tells you that this, in order to be a solution here, is just a function of x. And similarly, there is no y in here either. So q is also just a function in terms of x. So these two functions, p and q, only depend on the first coordinate, first entry. So I can just, first of all now, I can just cross out every dependence on the second thing here. So the function, the eigenfunction, it still depends upon x and y, and y, as in which part you are, in which triangle you are on in the unit square. But then, when it's here, all the level curves, wherever they look like, is like this. That's going to depend on y. So now you can actually, now you realize that this is actually a system we can solve. First one, take the derivative with respect to x now. So we get lambda p prime of x is equal to the negative q of x lambda q prime of x p of x minus q of x. And that's a linear system in p and q. And 
easy, you can solve it. It's not hard. You can mess it all. Don't give it you, to your Calc 3 students. And then you have to plug it back in here to find the condition on lambda. What is lambda equation? And you do all this thing. I'm going to spare you the details from now on. And you're going to get that the eigenvalues lambda we get is the form square root of 3 over 2 pi k plus a third with k is an integral. That's how it pops out. And so notice how it lies. It all lies, all the eigenvalues lies in the real axis. And it gets closer and closer to zero from both sides. And if you look carefully, you see that the largest eigenvalue, the one furthest away from zero, is a positive eigenvalue. And then the eigenfunctions, e to the minus x over 2 lambda times cosine pi over 6 square root of 3 over 2 x over lambda. This is x less than y. We get sine pi over 3 plus square root of 3 to x over lambda for y less than x. However, so what? This one difficult problem here. I grew up with matrices and fine dimensional vector spaces. Everything is nice in the fine dimensional, fine dimensional case. However, we're working here on um, an L2 space of a unit square. So strange things can happen here. So you have to find results from analysis that tells you that things are nice. So to just to give some background analysis, let me, let me just write down what happens when you apply this operator twice to the function x. That means in the definition, so I have this shift here in the variables. I'm going to do this shift twice. I'm going to get two integrals. Chi stx times chi txy times fst ds dt. If I write it this way, the, anal the analysis gets happy. Why? If we go look at this way, you see that this looks like matrix multiplication. Namely, this corresponds to the sum. This is my matrix here. So my variables are really here. ST is one of my variables. So this is really the matrix A, as I try to write the right length, in terms of one variable for x, y, s, t, and here in terms of the function, multiply the matrix A with a vector here, s, t. So it looks like matrix multiplication. For analysis, that happy, because that says that this is a, is a Hilbert Schmidt operator. And the word now you say, ah, it's a compact operator. I confess, I haven't quite figured out what they mean by compact. However, this says that all the theorems are nice. Things are going to work in this case. So what we need. Well, if you just write down an operator, 
you can find you can find very awful looking operators on an L2 space. But this, if I write like this, point out this looks like a, they call this the kernel and this is the function and they did Hilbert Schmidt and things are gonna be nice. Yeah, and th that that comes out now. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, but in order in order to apply it, we need something more, and the nice thing here is that the operator square is compact, and that's what we had to okay. that I had to pull out from my colleague. Okay. So, theorem. I to get all the details right. So. I assume that lambda 1 for lambda k are the eigenvalues of modulus greater than r. So I want to take the largest eigenvalues. I assume that they are simple. And that's something in this case, you still have to go in and verify that the eigenvalues I found here are simple eigenvalues. But that gives you a huge calculation, is tedious. And then we have eigenfunctions v1 for vk. And then I'm also going to need adjoint eigenfunctions psi1 to psi k. I, to every operator, this is the adjoint operator, and I had to find what the eigenfunctions are of these operator too. Turns out in this case, it's actually depends, you only have to switch things here because there's so much symmetry in it. So they're actually explicit in this case. Then, this quantity I want to have, normal permutation of n factorial, which is tn minus 2, 1, 1. It's given by the sum, angle 1 to k, Eigenvalue with constant function one, constant one with the adjoint eigenfunction, the complex conjugate, and then eigenfunction and the adjoint eigenfunction again, times lambda i to n minus two, and that's going to be n minus two, same as this n minus two, plus the error term. Yeah. Yeah. So remember, uh, in the complex plane, if this is my eigenvalues, I took r here, and I took everything outside the disk of r. So, in the case I was interested in, You get alpha n of n factorial. You do the calculations. Sum all integers k. 
interest in capital K, minus 1 to the K exponential function 1 over eigenvalues, the constant comes out, lambda K to the n plus 1 plus the error term, lambda minus K minus 1 to the n. Where lambda k was so this is the asymptotic expansion I can get. You get the asymptotics by taking k equal to zero. That's the largest eigenvalue. Uh, but you can get better approximations as angular to infinity, but using more and more eigenvalues in it. However, it's a little bit disappointing because remember the eigenvalues, they all are real and they all jump back and forth here and get closer to zero. But notice that when the eigenvalues go to zero from the positive side, this constant of head, this constant goes to positive infinity. So the constants here get larger and larger and larger. So this is far I can get. What I had hoped for was that I would say I can free in more and more eigenvalues and make the error term go away to get then converge in series to the, the result I wanted. But that we can't get. So there's a limit to this method that I cannot get exact answers coming out from it because this grows too big. So what does that say in the brief? This, well, maybe I should write it as little k for minus capital K. K is, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. This would be great k here. It's a positive integral. Yeah, I was hoping for that. Yeah, because that also what happened when I started alternating permutations, which you know is given by the Euler number, is you can apply this method, you can get small constants here, and you will actually get a series for the Euler number. No, you just so because, because the lambdas are decreasing, right? So, so the lambdas are strictly are strictly decreasing the absolute frame. So yeah, they're strictly decreasing the small inside. Yeah, it means it's a known constellation. Yeah. So minus one to the zero. Uh, well, I, uh, yeah, but uh, th th there's no I, I had no way to control it. That's the problem. Oh. Uh. Yeah. However, at least you mean you have no way to control it because of the constant the exponential is wilder to Yeah, the, the, yeah, for the positive eigenvalues this gets big. But, yeah, but but you know that for every n that is big uh, so for every field scale if n is big enough then uh, then it becomes negligible with respect to uh, to the field itself, right? Yeah. But uh, but I can't let capital K go to infinity. That it's, it doesn't convert. That's the problem. And, and you see, if you look at the negative eigenvalues, remember that when lambda is negative, this goes close to zero. For the, so the negative eigenvalues, the constant goes to zero here. No, I meant k even and odd. So the minus one to the k. The, the negative ah, okay. Five and six may cancel each other and give you a very small n. But not because the lambdas are strictly increasing the absolute frame. Mm. I mean, they're not perfectly cancelled, but just give you something small. But they're much smaller than much smaller. Well, not, not for a large n. I mean, it's different numbers in this case. It's yeah, six to n. So yeah, the, 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 the next. For large n, it's only. Large yeah. Two square to six three. Yeah. 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 So this is as far I can get it in this case. But now, at least, it gives me a general method for looking at. Um, <coughs> these problems of 
when we look at permutation and we want to avoid a consecutive pattern that I can translate into this operator and then using results about operators I can bring some of it back and say something about the asymptotics. So it's more general. Yeah, so the asymptote is given by k equal to zero here. Yeah. Well, previous results was for computing. Uh, uh, Sergey Elisade had been meant to limit alpha n over n factorial and the n fruit here. Yeah. So. But here, but they still can, but this doesn't apply even the first term here. So this is stronger. So you're saying that this segment with small yeah. forward is uh, the and Mark Noy. And, and they obtained the result by starting the problem obtaining the generative function and then looking for how the genuine function behaved. Yeah. That's an interesting question. <laughs> well, why you work out the hexagon? I'll continue my talk. Well, what would make me really happy would be some way to actually get the convergence series for this number. Right. So I mean, did it have to go be, OK, do you just care about the so bounding the error term from that, from that estimate? Or well, I mean, assume that I would like to compute alpha 1,000. Right. But How many terms did I put in here? I mean. Yeah, I mean, that would be fun. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but, but let me show you something else that made me happy, okay? So for x1 to xn, n numbers, real and distinct. So I want to define capital pi of these numbers to be the permutation that they encode. I, so this is a permutation, symmetric group on elements. So xi is less than xj. That should be equivalent to pi i less than pi j for all in this i and j. This turns out to be a very useful notion here. And then, over.
So for S, a subset of permutation of length m plus 1, and we say that the pi avoids S if this capital function of pi of I take any length of length m plus 1, pi pi i plus 1, up to pi i plus m. So I just read off m plus 1 enters in permutation. I apply pi, so I redo it to a new permutation that this does not belong in the set S. So what we did before was 1, 2, 3 avoiding permutations, consecutive avoiding. So, so you, you care that these are consecutive when you're doing things, but yeah. not the subsequence. Yeah, <laughs> yeah to be con consecutive. So then, of course, we define alpha n of s to be the number of permutation pi symmetric open n elements. That avoids S. So now we can go and say, well, we can avoid other patterns, not only one, two, three. And so let's look at two, one, three. Wait, wait a moment. I go, I'm just jumping ahead in time. So now, just like this, I can now define an operator. So I'm going to be working on the L2 space on the n-dimensional hypercube. So the function chi x1 through xn plus 1 is going to be 1 if capital pi of these numbers not in S and zero otherwise. I have the operator now, I take a function in M variables. I have the integrate, I have put in a new variable T, X1 for XM function T, X1 up to x and minus 1. So notice there's a shift in the function and dt. And then this theorem applies. The only thing actually correct now is this is minus m and minus m. So we can now do calculations for other pattern avoidance. However, the problem is the following. To solve for the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions, it gets very, very hard. So the only other case I can do this in. You have like in, in Victoria preserving uh, uh, separated computers. Yeah, I get too many parts. And the thing in the previous case here was this that you see it didn't depend on the, fun the second coordinate here. Why? Now if you just give me a general pattern, there's no such thing. It gets a complete mess. I can't solve it. The thing I can do is for 2, 1, 3 avoiding permutations. I get the eigenvalues <coughs> such as the equation the error function of 1 over square root of 2 times lambda the eigenvalue should be equal square root of 
2 over pi. That's not a nice equation. Yeah, this is the equation I get in this case. And if you look at the roots, well, there's going to be one real root to this. That's easy to see. It's going to be positive. It's going to be the largest root. And then all the other roots come in pairs, and then it gets more and more closer to zero. So I can't, we can't solve this exactly. And yeah. so even for changing this from one to three to two one three avoiding is get difficult. So it's given by error function of x is two over square pi integral zero to x e to the minus t square dt. Yeah, yeah. So, so I know if you, if you pick up the real root here, you get asymptotics. But yeah, but even this one you can only approximate. You have a nice transcendental root here. I mean, yeah, that's what it is. Okay. So, but one thing we can do here is. I can actually give a result. Remember from matrix theory, going back to finite dimensional vector spaces again, this Fourbian is Perron that says that if you have a matrix with positive entries, you know it's going to have a largest eigenvalue. Yeah, so, so at the moment I said, I said everything is positive at the moment. Yeah. So then there's a lot of eigenvalues is positive, real, and simple. <coughs> but you can put in a few zeros in the Frobenius Peron, and you're going to be safe. Well, there's a similar result in function analysis and Banach spaces. So they do to Prime <coughs> Rotman that says, well, if f, you say f is positive, a function in the L2 space, if f of x is greater than zero almost everywhere. So even my calculations I did here, notice that I didn't care what happened, for instance, here, but when on the diagonal x equal to y, because it has to match to zero. So this is almost there. We say that f is non-negative, is non-ending almost everywhere. So an operator t is positively <coughs> improving if for a non-negative function different from zero that exists for positive integral k so that operator applied k times of this thing gives a positive function. Then T has the largest eigenvalue, which is simple, real, and positive. So this is the, the infinite dimensional case of Fabianus Perron. And we can apply this thing in our <coughs> case here. Oops. 
and we can translate this condition of positivity improving into back to the pattern avoidance. So I'm going to define as a graph that H be a directed graph with vertex set and and I know you're not going to like this. I take the open m-dimensional unit cube. There's a lot of points there. I can remove all the points that has two coordinates equal. So all the vectors x that is x are equal to xj. That means I take the cube and then anywhere that lies on these hyperplanes, I throw away this point. So it's really just the union of the open simplices. Okay? And you have directed edges x1 over to xm should be directed edge to x2 or the x n plus 1. If I take the order of these m plus 1 numbers, and this should not be a forbidden pattern. Now, theorem, if H is ergodic, i.e. strongly connected and a periodic, then The operator T is positively improving. So it's going to have a largest eigenvalue with a simple real and positive. <coughs> and hence, you know that asymptotes in this case, numbers such as avoiding permutations, is given by constant times this eigenvalue. plus a smaller error term. So we can get out that by looking at this graph, and even though you say it's infinite number of vertices, it's easy to prove in cases when you give me a set if this graph actually is strongly connected or not. And for instance, So I'm only interested in cases m greater than 2. And if this set is equal to 1, this theorem applies. And this proved the conjecture by Varlemont that he had actually explicit conjecture that the asymptotes had to look in this form. The graph H. No, no, no. Very simply, rich gets passed from every vertex to every other. Yeah. Oh, so in the, in, in the prescribed direction. Okay. Yeah. And, then, yes. and also at periodic, that means that if you give me any two vertices, if you look at the lengths on the path from x to y, yeah. the possible lengths, there's going to be some large integer k, so there's always a path of any integer greater than k between them. You're not going to get into some cyclic behavior that 
you, you can go from x to y, the number of steps you can go do that has always been multiple of something. Yeah. S is the set of forbidden permutations. Oh, okay, okay. But it's actually, in working with this graph, it's actually easy to work with this, working with this infinite thing, because that means when you had to pick a new vortex yeah, to go to, that means you had to pick a new real number here. And it's always, you can always, between any two other real numbers, pick another real number to put in there. So you have actually, it actually gives you a big freedom here. That if you restrict yourself to taking just, say, k values in between 0 1 here, then you're not going to have that freedom at some point. So it's actually it's convenient to work with the whole open interval. Yeah, I can take the rational. Okay, or yeah, but but that doesn't really help. You just take all the reals. Yeah. So if you would want, or if the conjecture would fit, uh, I mean, like a weaker thing is just to say that the n, that the n proof of this goes to infinity. Yeah, but now we have to get the other. It does look like this way. Yeah. Yeah. But this actually gives a pretty clean proof of this result. Okay. Which is like without, without actually computing. Uh, yeah, without getting your hands too dirty, OK? So do you have your, uh, your favorite small set S in U to compute as an estimate of lambda per U, or is that still a trade off? You, you, you can. You can actually, because what you can do is just you can take this function and then you can just let Maple iterate this thing, definition, and that's going to work quickly, and then you can actually estimate it very quickly. I mean, and also these results tells you, you know, that you can estimate the first thing, and after you good estimate here, then you can go in and you can estimate the next eigenvalue. Yeah, yeah, but but you can subtract subtract this term off here, and then you can go in and estimate the next one. Do you just know the eigen uh, function for that? Uh, no, if you're just looking at these values, computing this thing, you can actually avoid having the looking at eigen functions. These ones can help with this, right? Or they they can help uh, several yeah. of the same uh, of the same eigen. Yeah. Yeah, but even strange in the case of Two one three avoiding permutations, we were able to prove that all the eigenvalues are simple. Because okay. I seem to remember that the De Bruyne graph uh, has many, many, well, of course it's finite, but uh, right now, but and it has, I think, many eigenvalues of the same, uh, of the same optimal state. Okay. But, but it's finite, so I'm not sure what this means. So what is that? Yeah, but this, at least the, your theorem will not tell you that uh, that was other no, I mean, the, the Klein Rutman just talks about the largest eigenvalue. Just like Forbearance Pronoun talks about the largest one. Okay. Thank you very much.